Hello and welcome back to the game room. You know what I love? Video games. You know what I love? Talking about games. And it seems like a lot of people these days who cover games seem to hate them. Or at least the people who play them. Well that's not me and that's not the 3,661 of you beautiful people checking out this video here today. Well, not much happened in this last week, right? Not kind of craziness? Yeah. <laughs> but hey, it does seem like the world is healing. You had Sony coming out saying they're not going to be making another game like Concord, focusing on single player games, a lot of other companies making similar announcements. So I for one am excited. Maybe we are at a turning point now where we can just get back to enjoying games instead of being told what we need to like. And part of that will be contributed by the interesting game known as Dragon Age Veilguard, which we'll reference later on in this video. But hey, as for me, we got another 10 Xbox 360 games to dive into. So if that sounds interesting to you, let's check it out. There's a lot of games out there, some of which you've never even heard of. That's where I come in. My name's Luke. I've been playing games since the age of two, and I have no life. This is my game room. Alright, the first game we're going to talk about today is one that was recommended to me by you guys a couple times in the comments, though it may have been the same person. And this was a game I will full-heartedly admit I did not have on my radar and probably would not have picked up if not had been recommended by you guys. And that is the Chronicles of Narnia, the Prince of Caspian? Yeah, Caspian. And I'm not quite sure how to feel about this game. You put it in and it's got real digitized movie scenes, but it's, you know, this, this was made probably in the late 2000s, so it's not completely crisp like you would find on today's games. There's definitely a lot of artifacts in it. And I haven't seen the movies, so I'm assuming it's using real life footage of the movies. Uh, from an outsider's perspective, I always thought these Narnia movies looked like a ripoff of a mix of the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. And apparently this is from a book series that is phenomenal, though I think the movies made it so that a lot of people like me, who might have been into the books, never really got into it. And this game, I'm gonna say, it doesn't really help all that much. It definitely does remind me of the Lego games, which was to the comments I saw before, but I'm gonna say I don't really care much for the Lego games. They get a little repetitive, there's no challenge to them, other than the zany humor the first time I played it, when I think they, were, they did the Lego games for the first three prequel Star Wars games. I wasn't really in that into it, especially because I have no reference point to this game. What it does is it gives you four different characters you can switch between. So you have a Minotaur, a, a, sir, a Centaur, uh, a, a, like an Elf Archer, and then a Dwarf. And then each one of them you can swap between awkwardly. And they allow you to progress different areas of this hub world stage. And then by going to the different areas, it unlocks almost like a mini game where you go through with certain characters who need to accomplish certain tasks to then move on to the next stage. And I imagine that once you finally defended the keep, it then kicks you back to that main church looking thing where you then select a new stage. Um, didn't really garner much other than the all the giants are bald dudes who look like my buddy Rewind Mike. But it, it was fun enough. It definitely It's a co-op game. Now, it looks like it would be four-player co-op, but looking on the back, it's a two-player co-op game. So I can imagine this would be a really fun little brother game or a person who's not into games type game because there's really no challenge to it. I think I played it on medium. Maybe I should have played it on hard. But I just went in there, button mashing, got through the, the levels. The, the graphics are decent. It reminds me a little bit of a mix of the GameCube Lord of the Rings Return of the King game mixed with a Lego game, if that makes sense. So it's not quite a Lego game. It's not quite that action beat em up type thing. Overall for a $6 game, still worth picking up. Something I'd give more shot to, but this is one I'm firmly gonna put in the camp of stick to two player because I don't think as a single player experience it's really all that worth it. But maybe I'm also just jumping in at a bad time. I should probably at least be somewhat familiar with the movies or the books or at least the universe. 
But what are you going to do? Uh, still, thank you for the suggestion. That was really, I mean, for a 5 $6 game, couldn't ask for more. And keep them coming, guys. If you have other games like that you want me to check out, I, I can't say that I'll love it, but I'll always give you my honest opinion. And honestly, I still think it's a game worth having, just not my cup of tea. Now, another game I picked up that... I had never heard it before. This was that same British YouTuber who I, I really should go back and look up who it was because they provided several suggestions. You got Falling Skies, uh, you had Shell Shocked, and then you had Monster Madness, The Battle for Suburbia. Now, I've come across this game a few times, never picked it up. It just kind of looked like a generic grabbed by the ghoulies type thing. But when I finally saw some gameplay footage of it, it evoked a lot of zombies ate my neighbors feel and that's precisely what i would say this game is trying to be it is more or less a zombie ate my neighbors spiritual successor like it doesn't have anything directly tied to the older game but it's got that comic book art style it's got that same isometric isk view they even have a joke about zombies eating your neighbors at the beginning of the game there's Four-player co-op in it, too, and local co-op at that, but it kind of feels like a mix between that Zombies Ate My Neighbor game style and then sort of a dungeon crawler in the Dungeon Siege 3 or uh, Crimson Alliance or something like that, because each one of the characters, so you have four different character archetypes. You have the nerd, the goth girl, the dude bro, and then the, um, I guess, the cheerleader hot chick. And they, they each get their own primary weapon, but everything in the level you can pick up and throw. The the zombies don't pose too much of a challenge. It's got a little bit of that Zombies 8, or not Zombies, it, well yeah, definitely Zombies 8 My Neighbor, but also Plants vs. Zombies in the way the zombies behave and that they have certain themes. Like you'll have Fat Zombie, like Disco Zombie, Blow Up Zombie. But the first stage feels very much like it was ripped right out of Zombies Ate My Neighbor. But then after that, you kind of get to an overworld where you navigate through it and then get different tasks to go through it. So you're going through a park, you have to survive. There's a truck you can come across that allows you to upgrade your items or to get new items. So when I was playing it, I unlocked the uh, nail guns. So instead of finding the, the weapons throughout the level that you will permanently keep, like you can find things like a chainsaw, but the actual permanent weapons I think you only get from this dude so there's things like rocket launchers etc but overall especially for a 15 20 dollar game this one has flown under the radar substantially in my opinion I've seen nobody else talk about it not saying it's phenomenal another great option for a co-op game and one that is still pretty dang solid by yourself the humor is not too over the top it, it's decent enough it's definitely, you know, it definitely suffers from a little bit of that late 2000s dude broness, but in a good way. And if you like Zombie Ate My Neighbors and are looking for something that really evokes that, I have not found anything that has come out in the last 20 years that does it as well as this. So really something that if that sounds interesting to you, you should go pick it up because this one is very, very under the radar and a lot better than I thought it would be. And something that you know I'm, I'm glad to have in the collection and you guys should definitely pick it up too all right now the big boy we're talking about this week is one that I've already touched base on in either the first or the second week but I never actually played it so this time I decided to pop it in and that is spectral force 3 the funny thing about this game is I actually bought it twice. I bought it online and then I found it in my local game store and luckily I was able to cancel my online order before the before it showed up. So that I got it at the game store because at the time it was like 25 at the game store and then literally the next week it shot up to a $100 game and I think it's still floating around there. This is the third game in the Spectral Force series though it's the only one that ever came out to the West as far as I know. And then at the beginning of the game, I believe they, if they are connected, because they, they give kind of like a summary of uh, kind of like Lord of the Rings where it's like, oh, this happened and this king was defeated. They give a summary of someone being defeated. I don't know if that has to do with the first or the second game, but more or less you play as a group of mercenaries. And at the very beginning of the game, the, the contract that owns your mercenary contract gets killed by these demons that are overwhelmingly more powerful than anyone knew, kills the king, throws the whole region into uproar, but you you guys as mercenaries can go and pick and choose who's going to be your next contract but you then take over as the mercenary fleet and then all the other mercenaries abandon you except for this one healer dude and that's where it takes place 
as far as game wise goes it is very much like earlier fire emblem games or like vandal hearts if you know the vandal heart series on ps1 it gives you sort of a blank map where you can go to the map, go to the next place, go to the armory, check out your guys, but there's no meaningless overworld to explore, at least not in the time I played it. As far as combat goes, it is turn-based strategy, which is one of, if not my favorite genre to play. I love it so much, and I love when I play a new game in the genre that really gives a nice flavor to how it plays. And with this one, you get a light attack, a heavy attack, and a medium attack in your attack phase after you move or you can flip it around so some of your attacks will have a chain attack so if you have a heavy attack that hits someone up you then will get the corresponding action to hit them down you also sometimes will get the ability to link in a partner so you can see assist and then you can allow them to attack or you can allow them to do a combo sometimes you can throw that across the entire map you have certain characters that rely on healing them, uh, healing others, so they can still come in handy. And there's no retaliation, so it's not like in Fire Emblem where you attack, they attack. No, it's more Final Fantasy Tactics. You attack them, they attack you. All your troops go, and then all their troops go. So that's kind of how the combat plays off. Now the thing that is going against this game for the most part is the graphics are pretty dated looking. It looks very similar to Vandal Hearts 3, which for a game that came out in the late 2000s on the 360 and as an RPG, strategy RPG, I can see why it didn't do so well. Had it had a better art style, more in line with pixel art, I think it could have been more popular. If this had been something I had seen, I can tell you, it wouldn't do it now, but at the time, the art style would have kept me from playing it. But actually playing it, I was sold on it. I didn't care about the art style. I could see where this game was going, and it is really, really fun. Don't be turned off by the art style. Unfortunately, the price may still turn you off. So that's really the biggest uh, downside with this. But as someone who loves tactical turn-based games, this is one that's very, very intriguing. Now, I've, like I said, I haven't played that much of it, but to get the, the get the scope of how the combat works, allowing you to trade off turns, have multiple attacks, because when you attack enemies, it looks like you do no damage because everyone's health bars are so damn big. And when you love up you can decide which trait to level up so it's very much in line with what you're gonna do there are treasure chests on the field that you have to hit to open up all in all though really intriguing I can see why this game has skyrocketed I can see why people say it is a good game other than the art style everything else about this game is a winner like I said especially if you like tactical games and aren't aren't into that exploration as much like I just want to get to the matches that's the biggest problem I have with more recent fire emblems specifically three houses is I found myself spending way too much damn time in the monastery I just wanted to get to the next match that's why I love path of radiance you had a chapter you had exposition and then you had a match same thing in vandal hearts there was not too much fluff in these newer fire emblems they especially post awakening you can have the option to go and grind your team same thing that happened when I did Tactics Ogre back in the day. Uh, and to an extent, Final Fantasy Tactics is that way too. But it really just, when you're spending a lot of time going around giving flowers to people, having lunch with people, trying to romance them, it really made the support conversations not as impactful. Uh, but anyways, I'm getting off on a tangent. Uh, Spectral Force 3, very, very fun. If you can find it cheap, pick it up. And, uh, right now, like I said, because of this basement. If this sounds interesting, get it. Because it's just going to keep going up. All right, another game that I have spoken of before, but I never actually played it, and that is Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. And my goodness, I knew that this was a good game off word of mouth, but I cannot put into words the amount of badassery I experienced in just the brief 45 minutes to an hour of popping this game in. Not only does it turn Raiden, who was just the biggest wuss, in my opinion, in Metal Gear Solid 2, into the most incredible badass in, what, in 5-10 minutes, but it also just sets the stage for such a cool game the way it plays out. Immediately, you're taking out a Metal Gear Ray within the first boss fight and just dis devastating it. You have a really cool antagonist that is built, a couple of them actually, and they, they use a big 
set piece fight on a train. Things don't go your way. You're getting cut up left and right. You come back. You have a new cyborg mode and now you can suddenly absorb the cells and the life force of other cyborgs. It's exceptionally violent. People getting cut down the middle, cut in the side. It's so badass and cool. Much more so, like this is the game that in my opinion put Platinum Games on the map in a bigger way than even something like Bayonetta. And I don't think they've ever gotten back to this because this is the game that convinced myself to really give a lot of those Platinum Games moving forward a chance. And I always felt a little bit disappointed. But going into this one, not whatsoever. And also, I hope you guys picked up the free DLC I spoke about in my video a few months ago. Because there was complete free DLC where you could play as one of the antagonists in their own separate campaign. Or as a, a wolf cyborg in its own separate campaign. That I think is still available to download because I believe this game is backwards compatible. So definitely jump on that if you are interested. But my goodness, what a fun time. And just really, really incredible. And good on Konami to be able to do this with Raiden. And it's so funny. I remember when the when the reviews came out for this game, they were kind of mediocre. And like, not that great, ho-hum. But everyone I ever spoke to who played this game said it was amazing. And I gotta tell you, that's how it is. This is a very, very... Now, it's not super deep. It's still a little obtuse with that Konami-ness or that Kojima-ness. Uh, but it really... If you wanted to play a Metal Gear Solid game that was over-the-top action-based, you're not going to find a better option than this one. And it really did such a great job of, in my opinion, uh, retconning people's distaste for Raiden in Metal Gear Solid 2. Because nowadays you don't find anyone talking about it. No one really thinks anything of it. But at the time, it was really a large disconnect. But now he's just as cool as the ninja from Metal Gear Solid 1. And that's what it feels like. It feels like you're playing as ninja from Metal Gear Solid 1. But even cooler. And I can go on for this game. But man, what a turnaround on that one. And it's just, I knew I would like it based on what everyone said. But such a good one. That's one you can find for 15 or 20. Uh, pick it up. Definitely pick that one up. It's a good one. Okay, now this is one that is, yeah, another common, but I gotta bring it up just because this is probably one of my favorite games on the system, and that is Mass Effect 2. Uh, I know there's the Legendary Edition where you can play on modern consoles. I believe this was the first one that was on PS3 and PS2. It's like a $5 game, but my goodness, what a great series this was. I, I know I'm talking, and what a great developer Bioware was. I mean, Mass Effect was the one of the first games that really taught me about a narrative-based video game back in 2010, I want to say, when it came out, as far as what it could be. Because in 2010, I believe I played this game, Red Dead Redemption. Like I really got some heavy story-based games that really brought me back into the console realm, not just playing the Call of Duty, not just playing Halo after coming off World of Warcraft. And the really cool thing that Mass Effect gave the illusion of is that it made you believe that your choices influenced the outcome of the game. And in some cases, they did. It had such a cool system with the Renegade and the Paragon system that, I mean, I, I don't know if it was Mass Effect 2, but there's, there's a clip going around where you have this guy who's being an egotistical jerk standing out front of a window, and you have the option to just push him through the window. And at the time, that was something that just was unheard of. You did not see that in a game. And the fact that as the main protagonist, you were allowed to go down that road. And if you did, it started reflecting on your character. You started getting red lines all over you, looking like some crazy demonic creature. And it was such a fun game that I beat it, I want to say two or three times. Because I did a Paragon playthrough, and then I did a Renegade playthrough. And what also was very special about it is that it truly made you feel like your playthrough meant something because of the end of the game with the suicide run. So you could recruit characters as the game went throughout, and then you had a chance to improve your morale with them by doing their side missions or just having certain conversations or decisions. And based on a decision you made in hour 20, when you get to that suicide mission in hour 30 they may just be far gone. They may not be able to be saved. Or they may be able to be saved depending on who you choose to do certain options. And I remember going through it the first time and losing a character like Legion or losing a character like Jack or somebody else and just feeling absolutely 
devastated to the point where I had to go through, play the game again, and make sure I saved everyone. Not to mention, there's even the options in the game to romance characters, which was not something I really saw in a big budget game up until then. And on and on. I mean, you can even do the suicide mission where everyone dies. Um, now, when Mass Effect 3 came out, it, it kind of lost a little luster because all of the cast from Mass Effect 2, with the little exception, are not available in Mass Effect 3. But they do, they do kind of relate somewhat. And then also looking back at Mass Effect 1, it was interesting to see how those choices panned out. But just a really... And also the first game I really found out about story-based DLC. Because I downloaded some of those story-based DLCs too. So just all in all a really good benchmark as far as the way games were trending at the time. But also just um, one that was a little misleading once it got to the third one. Which is part of why so many people were upset with the ending of 3. Because I believe there was a lot more people who played 2 than played 1. Because uh, 2 kind of was the one that really fulfilled the promises of 1. Um, but overall, really good game, one I'd still highly recommend checking out, even if you don't play any of the other Mass Effects, this one is great. And one of those things that, you know, unfortunately, Bioware is not doing that anymore. Things like with Dragon Age Veilguard, you really can't decide to play as a jerk. And yeah, you know what, you probably shouldn't play as a jerk, but also, sometimes it's fun to go down that path, because <laughs> that's, that's, that, it's a video game, that's the whole point. But yeah, Mass Effect 2, really good one. Uh, definitely recommend that if you've never played it. And it's on modern consoles too. Okay, now here's one that I picked up at the swap meet. And I've been talking about it. I, I mentioned it in the PS3 game. Uh, the PS3 games I wish I had. Well, I did pick it up on the 360. And that is XCOM The Bureau Declassified. I even found a copy that has the dang slip case. So score was only $5. I made a deal. The guy threw it in for free. And I gotta tell you, as someone who says XCOM is one of my favorite game series, not playing this game until now is an absolute travesty because it really takes the Firaxis XCOM Enemy Unknown formula and formulates it to a third-person cover-based shooter, almost in line with Mass Effect. So you get two allies that come with you and you can designate what they do on the field. They have cooldowns, they can get incapacitated and you can heal them, or they can die permanently. And you control one main character, and that's the one who's going to be going through and taking the shots. And it is a third-person shooter, but there is a little bit of that tactical strategic planning you can put on it. Where you can throw grenades, you can drop a turret, you can just tell your characters to go and flank the enemy and take them out. Now, as far as the strategy goes, I didn't get into it too deep, but it looks like XCOM. It has the same feel as XCOM. The maps look like <laughs> Enemy Unknown, and it is a really a fun time. And I've seen a few people in the comments say that it's a good game, and I am with you. I am definitely with you. This is one if for XCOM fans. It's funny, at the time, I did not want it at all, but now that it's been far enough removed, going back to it is almost like finding an old friend or finding finding something that you would have enjoyed as a child and didn't know existed. Kind of like when I went back to the Super Nintendo and found games like Treasure of the Rudris or Terranigma. You know, you may not have appreciated it at the time, but now that so much time has gone on since you've had that experience, it's a real nice in, influx of nostalgia, but at the same time, newness. So, if you like XCOM, that's a fun one, and it's dirt cheap, well worth picking up, and yeah, keep an eye out for the slipcover. Alright, another game that is just an absolute necessity to get on the 360. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but this is the main reason why I got a dang 360 over a PS3 when I had a choice, and that is Gears of War. Now, I never owned Gears of War 1 until very recently. This is actually my older brother's copy of it, because when he got his 360, he got a copy of Gears of War, because I believe I had Gears of War 2 and 3, and we really liked it, but me and him had never played through Gears of War 1. And the co-op on Gears of War 1 is very, very solid. It's not as over the top as Gears of War 2 and 3 get, but it is still a very solid campaign. It is grounded. It introduced all the concepts that just made the series so popular, and then able to be a flagship for the 360, and a large reason why a lot of people, such as myself, chose the 360 over the PS3. The multiplayer was a big, big draw. 
But man, I just can't, I can't overstate how fun it was to do the chainsaw, as well as it really took that Resident Evil 4 over the shoulder formula and added a smart cover based formula that worked, the reload timing where you could hit it and be engaged with reloading it just it, it reminds and it has the same thing that you do in kind of the golf game so it implemented a fun mechanic that had been around for years in a way that was very unique epic at the time was doing very well making great games unfortunately they're only making fortnite now and launchers that nobody wants but gears of war really really fun game and just can't be can't be understated how pop or how influential that series was for the 360. All right, last couple ones here. So one that I wanted to talk about that I also picked up that the swap meet was not a game that was on my radar, but I saw it there and I had seen a few people talking about it. I do not know much about a lot of the long time racing series like Need for Speed, etc. Uh, but one I definitely knew nothing about was Ridge Racer and this is Ridge Racer 6. And I got to tell you, after playing Ridge Racer 6 for the limited amount of time I did, this is a really fun game. It is arcade as arcade racing goes. Uh, the graphics felt like I was playing one of those Sega arcade machines in the arcade. And the thing that made it very fun was the drifting was incredibly forgiving. So when you would go into a corner, you would hit the drift button. And then essentially your, your card is turned into a an easy dream to drift into those corners and then when you would get out of the drift you would hit the accelerator and then it's kind of like you locked yourself back in and why that is so different in this game than other games is a little bit hard to explain but it really it's one of those things where it makes you feel like you're a better driver than you are because what will happen in a lot of simulation racing games is you'll go and you'll try and drift but if you're going too fast you'll hit the wall or if you're doing this you'll hit that or you just have very little control think of it like in a mario game when you jump and then you need to move a little bit left or a little bit right versus in a castlevania game when you jump and once you jump there's no adjustment. You've committed to that. And that's kind of how the, the racing feels in this, is once you hit that drift button, immediately you can go right, left in a completely unrealistic way, but in a way that is very, very fun to play a racing game. On top of that, they allow you to set your own route, essentially through, there's like a couple hundred different race parameters you have. And as you complete these routes, if you complete all of them along the same triangle you, or the same whatever circle in the middle, if there's a question mark, it'll unlock a bonus. But why ma what makes it so much fun is that the if you go to the left, it's easier. If you go to the right, it's harder. But it allows you to set a set list. And one of the big problems I have with a lot of racing games is it feels like there's a lot of stopping and starting. It's like, okay, I played race one. It's a two-minute race. Okay, I'm out of it. Got the medal. Okay, on to the next race. All right, race two. Got it. Got the metal go for the thing all right next race three with this one it allows you to set a path of seven races much like guitar hero world tour would allow you to set a set list where you'd play six songs in a row not having to go back and select and back and select and i know that's a silly thing to think about but that's also something you should think about especially for game developers because the more time i'm spending enjoying the game and the less i'm thinking about what i should do to play the game it's kind of like when you're on netflix the less time i'm looking for something to watch versus i'm actively watching something is good and especially in a video game where I know I'm going to be playing the next race, instead of making me go and actively select it, why don't you just allow me to pre-select it and then make that a little bit of a game too, where if I play enough races and then I win enough of them, I can unlock something. So it's a brilliant scheme. I don't know if Ridge Racer does that a lot. Never seen it in any other racing game. And for that alone, this game is well worth it and one of the, uh, one of the better racers I've played on the system. So highly recommend checking out Ridge Racer 6. Everything you've heard about it. It is true it is fun a little you know the graphics aren't the best but as far as racing mechanics go it is exactly the kind of arcade racing i enjoy all right and the last game that we're going to talk about this week that i've mentioned before tenchu z so when i talked about it before i didn't know that from software had bought out the tenchu license at this time 
What's funny is they made this game right after they made Ninja Blade and a bunch of other games too. Like before they got Dark Souls, they were really going everywhere with the different genres they were trying to check out. But in this game, instead of playing as Ayame or Ricky Maru or one, essentially one of the established characters throughout the Tenchus, in this one you pull, you create your own ninja. So you create your own main character and then you create a support ninja. And that's, that's the biggest difference. Outside of that, it really does stay true to the Tenchu formula. It starts you off the first stage of the game, looks like it's ripped directly out of Tenchu 1, where it starts teaching you the mechanics, and it's still very heavily stealth-based, and you have the ability to connect and use a grappling hook, and you can kill people from ledges or pulling them down. You know, it's it's just as a, just a bloody good time as it was before. I really like the Tenchus on the PS1, and I think where this game may turn some people off is that it really does feel a little bit more like those older games. So this is not a hack and slash like uh, like the pla like Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. This is a much slower paced game, a much more methodical game, and unfortunately I'm guessing it didn't do all that well since we haven't seen the Tenchu series since then. I think the one drawback in my opinion is I wanted to play as Rikimaru and Ayami. I didn't want to play as a new character I created for myself, which is something FromSoft obviously struck pay dirt with with Dark Souls, but what are you going to do? But another one that has gone up, although it's leveled off a little bit, I think it's back down to around $20, $30. Pick that one up now if it sounds interesting. If you like stealth games uh, and if you like the older Tenchu games, it definitely pays homage and respect to those. And then the last game we're going to talk about this week is, I believe, the final Aliens game on the system. I had this one on my radar, but I wasn't really actively searching for it. But once again, that guy at the swap meet had a copy of this. No manual, but I got a good deal on it. And that is Alien vs. Predator. And this is definitely a game that came out around the time of, it, I think, the first movie. The or if not, it's it's using the same uh, the same background information that the first uh, Alien vs Predator movie did. Because the Whelan Corporation, the head of it, uh, is is. Lance Henriksen, I believe, and the big pyramid thing they're using looks just like the one from the first AVP, which are not great movies, but what are you going to do? And you can play as all three characters, so you can play a campaign as the alien, as a space marine, or as the predator, and I imagine that there's probably a big online component to this as well, but I'm really just interested in the campaigns, and I went through and I played the first chapter in all three of them. So for the Space Marine, this one largely feels like a an alien movie. You crash land into a war zone, or at least a colony that seems to be eradicated. And kind of like the beginning of Aliens, you're seeing what the hell happened. There's aliens everywhere. You're blowing them away. You're going and finding people, turning things on. And it's just, it, it seems like you're going against aliens. Not much of a predator influence I can see yet. In the predator playthrough, you are a new predator who's getting brought into the fold of these more advanced predators, I guess. And they're t training you by having you hunt aliens. So yet again, <laughs> the aliens are getting rocked. Now, this is the one where you felt the most um, powerful. So you could use the hand cannon. You could beat them up with melee attacks. And it really was a... I enjoyed this campaign probably the most of the three. Pretty straightforward though. And then the third campaign, you're playing as an alien that's very intelligent, that's trying to break out of containment because the Whelan Corporation has finally gotten these aliens to do experiments on. You're number six and you managed to break out and you managed to break out your siblings and then you're trying to go and help the queen escape. And it gets a little confusing with the way the controls work for the alien as well as you can jump onto the ceiling and you can kind of like you kind of lose your bearings after a while as well as the first stage of the alien is the most story based and the longest so it seems like maybe that was more of their focus in it but you have some cool abilities as the alien the tail whip you can take out lights and you can go and use your alien uh 
head bite and eat people's brains after you kill them for some reason. But as far as a, a bang for your buck, as this game runs, what, $15 to $30, something like that, definitely worth it for those three separate campaigns. And I, I had a good time playing it. I really did. Uh, like I said, I probably enjoyed the Predator one the most, and you really do feel like each one of the different creatures. So in Predator, you feel beefy and heavy and like you can go and bowl through a building. Space Marine, kind of standard. It feels like any other first-person, you know, Marine game, like in the way it did in Quake or in Alien Colonial Marines. And then as the Alien, that one was definitely the most jarring, but still glad they went that way. But yes, there you go, guys. Another 10 games that you should pick up before the prices stay the same. Yes, I know the FOMO's over. Yes, I know these videos have a clickbait title to get you to click on them. But... Even, even surprisingly so, I am getting more and more views each week. So yes, the Halloween video didn't do that well. I'm just saying that because the Halloween videos typically don't do that well. Last year's didn't either. But these videos have been doing great, <laughs> and they're not stopping. Um, probably going to get up to 30 by the end of the year, and then we might move on to a new subject. Because I will be honest... I'm starting to fray a little bit with some of these games, uh, largely because I'm not coming across any more huge bangers that I've known about, like Remember Me or Enslaved, or and I've gotten most of the expensive ones now too. But I, I could be wrong, like there was a few ones that surprised me this week, like Ridge Racer 6, I really did enjoy that one. But anyways, that's what you get for this week, guys. As a reminder, I release a new video every Tuesday. Thank you all so much for your comments, for coming back every week. Uh, really just means the world to me. I, I love having these discussions. I love seeing all the comments. And uh, you know, let me know if there's any other games you would suggest me checking out. Because as you've seen, I will go do it. All right, guys. It's been so nice getting a hold of you. Take care.